um, need to have a very, very high pedestal in our considerations. And um, so I was very pleased that we eventually formed a working group focused on safety culture, and uh, which has evolved into the working group on leadership and safety culture, which is chaired by uh, Commissioner Bond, who will be speaking after me. And this group has been tremendously important and interesting because now that we have a high level group um, that is talking about these issues, we are now seeing how the expertise that exists in our member countries is being brought together to really look at issues that simply weren't being analyzed in the past. And certainly um, the first report, the mutual impact of nuclear regulatory bodies and license holders from a safety culture perspective is an extraordinary example of that. Um, the issue of how the behavior of the regulatory body impacts the behavior of the licensees is something that has never really been discussed in any real detail. I, I certainly, as an NRC commissioner, saw examples where I felt that the behavior of the staff was actually affecting the behavior of licensees. Um, and this can be positive and negative, obviously. Um, if, if, and I think one of the cautionary notes that I have always thought about, and particularly as we go forward into the future, um, that regulators that take on too much of the responsibility for safety onto themselves do a disservice. Uh, in the attempt to try to improve safety, they take decision making increasingly away from licensees, which is not good for safety culture. It is actually very negative for safety, safety culture. But it's something that I don't think regulators are very conscious of because they feel that they're just doing their job. This, this report analyzes that and other aspects. Um, many areas of safety culture, um, I think, clearly come down to leadership. Um, the leaders of nuclear bodies and, and organizations are the ones that set the tone on everything they do and how they make decisions. This is extraordinarily important in establishing safety culture. It is not the only thing that's necessary for a strong safety culture, but it is definitely um, a necessary part of it. Um, practices for enhancing leadership for safety in nuclear regulatory bodies is another report from this group that, um, that analyzes this in detail. And it's very important to note that these are not philosophical reports. These reports were written by the, the working, by, the, by these task groups to be implementable, to be practical guides, to help regulatory organizations um, not just think about these issues, but take substantive action to improve their uh, posture. Um, so I really implore you to download the report. We have the QR codes on cards that are up here in front or down in the lobby. Uh, but just check the website of, from the NEA if you like. And, but download these reports and take a look at them because I think you'll find them to be quite interesting. Um, whenever we are looking at these issues, it's very important to recognize that we have made tremendous progress in so many areas of nuclear safety over the last um, 13 years since the accident. Um, I feel that even before the accident, we had a very, very safe infrastructure around the world in, in our member countries. Um, and the work that has gone into um, the introspection of every regulatory body that's represented here today to look at the accident, to question themselves, to analyze the safety of their facilities and the environmental conditions around those facilities, we have enhanced safety even further. Uh, than we were before the accident, and perhaps more importantly, in, enhanced resilience against the unexpected. This is a huge accomplishment. But at the, after all the procedures we've adjusted, the regulations that have been changed, the equipment that's been added to these facilities, they are still operated and overseen and regulated by human beings. And we human beings are usually the weak link in the chain. And so that is why this sort of thing is so important. Human beings and organizations that are responsible for nuclear safety and nuclear operations have to be well led and have to have the right safety culture. So it is certainly our hope that these two reports help organizations around the world further improve 
their safety culture and performance and help us bring a very, very high level of safety culture as we go into this future where it appears from most accounts that nuclear energy is going to be even more important in the future than it is today. So, um, David, thank you for, for sharing this, and I'm looking forward to the remarks and conversations from my colleagues here, all of whom I've worked with over many years, and um, certainly look forward to the questions from the audience. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for those remarks. It really sets the table for a great dialogue today. I really liked your point on the practical nature of the reports, and I, I hope that our panelists can share a little bit about uh, the practical experiences they've, they've had or tools they've used uh, uh, for emphasizing leadership and safety culture. I also always appreciate the focus on human beings. I, I think that's our, that is a challenge, but it's, it, it's the most rewarding part, I think, is changing hearts and minds. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, with that, Commissioner Bond, I um, ask you to proceed. Yeah, thank you. Um, I am Nobuhiko Ban, a commissioner of Nuclear Regulation Authority Japan, and I am chairing the Working Group on Leadership and Safety Culture of the NEA. I am excited to introduce our new report today. It has been published just today. Now, I give you a brief introduction of this working group, and it will be followed by presentations by two task leads. Committee on Nuclear Regulatory Activities, CNRA of NEA, created Working Group on Safety Culture in 2017. And it was restructured as Working Group on Leadership and Safety Culture in 2023. Current bureau members are shown in the slides. Mandate of the working group is to exchange information and experiences and to provide practical, innovative products to support the leadership and safety culture of the regulatory body and wider interconnected system. Member of the working group are regulatory bodies and technical support organizations. And interesting feature of this working group is it consists of senior management representatives and relevant experts, the mixture. And today's topic is output of the two task groups. One task group is impact of the regulatory body on the organizations it oversees and vice versa from a safety culture perspective. And another is leadership. These are names of the tasks and the title of the reports are a little different. And plans of these tasks were approved in the end of 2020. That means two task groups started their activities in 2021. And they finalized reports and they were approved last December and published just today. Now I would like to pass the floor to Mark McBride for his presentation on the first task. Mark, floor is yours. Thank you, Commissioner Barn. And good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to join this session today. <clears throat> so as Commissioner Barnes said, I have been the task lead for one of the pieces of work that we are launching today, looking at the impact that regulatory bodies and licensees on their respective safety cultures. And I would like to pay tribute to my colleagues in the task group for their diligence and skill in producing a report of high quality. Next slide, please. 
So the task we set ourselves three years ago was to understand how, through their everyday interactions, regulatory bodies and licensees impact their respective features and to practices and learn in this regard. And this task addresses important from events such as Fukushima Daiichi and the Boeing 736 MAX tragedies. Next slide, please. As you can see from this slide, we followed a rigorous methodology in conducting this study. We've undertaken nearly 50 interviews with senior stakeholders across 13 member countries, followed by extensive thematic analysis of the data. Next slide, please. So what did we find? Firstly, we identified the mechanisms by which each party influences the safety culture of the other. And primarily, this is through the communications, relationships and behaviours of staff at the interface between the two organisations. These in turn are influenced by the regulatory regime, for example, the system of legislation and standards and the regulatory body's priorities and decision making, as well as the leadership, management and capability of each organisation. And I've highlighted here leadership as a critical component, which is the focus of one of the two reports that the NEA is launching today. And finally, the ability of each party to learn from its interactions and improve is key to the influence that it is able to exert. Next slide, please. So what does it look like in interactions between a regulatory body and license? And the clear picture emerging from our study is of a reciprocal, cooperative style interaction characterized by respect, openness, trust, with a shared focus on safety learning. In other words, what we're describing is an adult to adult relationship where there is respect for each other's roles, openness and honesty and connections, but always with the common goal of safety. And within style of interaction, the regulatory body fosters the licensee's accountability for safety, enabling continuous improvement and growth of the licensee's culture towards more mature level. And we have called this accountability oriented in regulation. This builds on the concept of performance based regulation but includes a focus not just on outcome, but processes, in other words, how the outcome is achieved, with a clear link to risk and an encouragement for self-assessment by the licensee. Now, we recognize, of course, that this form of regulation is not always achievable, and therefore, that it's also important that the regulatory body is responsive in its approach and can adopt a more prescriptive style where that's needed. The aim, however, should always be to move towards accountability-oriented enabling approach. And we found two main factors which determine the balance of the regulatory body's approach namely the safety culture maturity of the licensee and of the regulatory body itself. In both cases, the more mature the culture, the more likely an accountability-oriented enabling approach will succeed. And of course, the approach that the regulatory body takes is also determined by the level of trust it enjoys from the public. 
Next slide, please. So from our study, we have developed a model for effective interactions between the regulatory body and licensee. And this comprises two continuous improvement circles, mutually reinforcing the safety culture of each organization. At the heart of the model, the green circle, are the communications, relationships, and behaviors of staff at the interface between the two organizations. Open, two-way, respectful, and trustworthy. And the model identifies the, with the factors which enable such an interaction, the orange circles, and highlights the importance of learning and improvement, the blue circles, recognizing that we may not get everything right first time. We encourage regulatory bodies and licensees to use this model to assess the health of their own interactions, to identify areas for improvement and good practices to share. Thank you for your attention. And I would now like to hand over to my colleague, John Thielen. Thank you, Mark. And also thank you, Commissioner Bond, for your earlier introductory remarks. My name is John Thielen, and I've been privileged to be task lead for the second NEA document mentioned by Commissioner Bond, and I feel very fortunate to be here today. The document I will present highlights various practical practices for enhancing leadership for safety in nuclear regulatory bodies. And to echo Mark's comments, I would like to pay tribute to the hard work of my colleagues in the task group associated with this report for their diligence and expertise, with a special recognition for the contributions of Joy Ho, Spencer Brown, and Catherine or Kitty Thompson, who is with us here today from the USNRC. Next slide, please. The NEA document that I will present today provides guidance to nuclear regulatory bodies to help enhance leadership for safety. Specifically, we set out to identify effective characteristics, competencies, and behaviors of leaders in regulatory bodies that have a healthy safety culture, and compile the information in a manner that would serve as practical guidance. To meet this objective, the team worked diligently, as said earlier, over a three-year period starting with the development of an outline and its approval, followed by a review of available literature, the conduct of an initial written survey, which was then followed, as Mark had mentioned, by in-person and virtually held interviews with leaders across both nuclear regulatory bodies and industry. The outcome is a document that is readily accessible to the reader, one that you navigate using figures and a series of related matrices or tables. The intent is that regulatory bodies can navigate the document in this way to readily identify leadership characteristics, competencies, programs, and processes they need for maintaining a healthy safety culture within their home organization. <clears throat> Next slide, please. To expand on that a little further, the document is intended to be used in various ways by various audiences. We expect the document can be used as a tool that organizations can integrate into their management system documentation so that effective leadership characteristics and competencies are embedded within their internal programs and processes. We anticipate the document can also be used by managers and leaders at all levels in an organization. Those who are responsible for or involved with regulatory strategies, activities, and interactions to strengthen the safety culture of their regulatory body. We foresee that training departments, human resources staff, and those that conduct self-assessments and safety culture specialists alike, they will also benefit from the document as it can be viewed as a reference for reviewing and improving regulatory body activities. Finally, we anticipate readers from regulatory bodies and licensees alike will be encouraged to undertake self-reflection, self-assessment, and related improvement activities. Next slide, please. Figure one presented here depicts the 12 characteristics and competencies recommended in the document for the development of effective leadership for safety in an organization. 
The methodology for development of these categories is set out in the annex of the document. For the purpose of the document, the term characteristics is referred to as general personal or organizational traits or attributes that may be inherent or developed through experience, whereas competencies represent the knowledge and skills required to perform a task or carry out responsibilities. Now these terms align with the practices and conclusions described in the NEA guidance on principles and attributes of a healthy safety culture and regulatory bodies published in 2016. However, this document puts forth a new perspective on leadership for safety by organizing these characteristics and related competencies into the categories of intellectual, interpersonal, and influencing factors, and linking these factors to effective strategies for their development. Intellectual aspects refers to the leader's ability to demonstrate knowledge, to identify, rationalize, and justify decisions, and to understand complexity in their operating environments. These aspects refer to characteristics and competencies that support decision making in leadership for safety. Interpersonal aspects refer to relationship building characteristics and competencies that assist in promoting safety within the regulatory body. Communication, role modeling, and actions taken to promote safety are highlighted under this category. And finally, influencing aspects refer to relationship management approaches to reinforce safety within and external to the regulatory body. Now these categories and related characteristics and competencies presented in this figure were developed, as said earlier, from the original data using qualitative analysis and have been expanded into three tables that accompany figure one. So within the document, three tables follow that describe good practices. And on the next slide, I will show you an example of one. And they're intended for developing and demonstrating the 12 competencies and characteristics recommended for effective leadership for safety. Presented here is one example from the influencing aspects report table. The importance of reinforcing expectations externally is shown here, meaning the need to communicate clear goals and expectations both internally to staff and externally to license holders. Good practices for regulatory bodies as well as individuals within regulatory bodies follow in the next two columns shown here. As leaders exist at all levels of an organization, these good practices are not solely for senior leaders but can be cross-cutting. Next slide, please. Next, the report illustrates programs and processes that promote leadership for safety for regulatory bodies. Figure two depicts five steps that are recommended for the development and maintenance of effective leadership for safety in the organization of a regulatory body. The figure points to the need for regulatory bodies in a continuous improvement model to develop a clear leadership model or framework, to identify leadership characteristics and competencies, and to establish leadership expectations and behaviors. The recommendation to implement a program for leadership for safety training and development and the benefits of conducting safety culture self-assessments. Next slide, please. Table two within the document aligns with the figure, and much like the first set of tables, this table also describes good practices for the regulatory body as an organization, as well as for the individual, for the programs and processes recommended for the effective leadership for safety. In this case, the excerpt provided here speaks to the conduct of safety culture self-assessments and independent assessments. And over to the final slide. And to recap, and on behalf of Mark, we're both proud representatives of team members within the Working Group of Leadership and Safety Culture and are glad to be here today to share a summary of these two NEA publications. As mentioned earlier, these two publications are now readily available for download, and we do have QR codes up front to help with that. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, well, let me just offer a, a sincere thank you, Commissioner Bond, Mark, and John, for the not just your presentation today, but for the hard work and the working group's work that went into this. It's very much appreciated. Um, as the Director General mentioned, uh, the those reports are available. I think there are QR codes that will link you to their availability. Um, 
At this point, we move to the panel discussion portion of our session. And um, I will, I think, first uh, want to let folks know that we didn't leave, we didn't give the panel a blank piece of paper and say, fill it with your thoughts on safety culture. It would have been fascinating had they done that. But we did provide a few questions for them to at least consider. Um, and I'll just let you know that each of our panelists has addressed one or more of these elements in their discussion, but we wanted to also have an organic flow so that they could share their personal thoughts. And I'm just going to highlight very quickly, uh, our questions were, were centered on what, what does it mean to be a leader in safety? What attributes and behaviors might a leader represent? What is the individual panis, panelist's experience with their ability to impact uh, safety cultures within the organizations? How can regular, regulatory bodies develop and sustain an accountability-oriented, enabling approach to regulation? How do you maintain and build trust in the public? And how can regulatory bodies use the findings in the NA, NEA reports to improve their regulatory effectiveness? So uh, you'll hear much of that uh, touched upon by our panelists. And if we could, Marta, could we start with you? Yeah, it's on, so thank you. Uh, in general, uh, I fully subscribe to the words which were said about publication by our distinguished representative, Mr. McWood, as well as Mr. Ben, uh, due to the fact that uh, safety culture was something what touched our lives directly after Chernobyl accident when safety culture uh, idea has been defined by IEA. Though uh, sometimes the way how it is identified for namely nuclear facilities, when we started to discuss about safety culture for a regulatory body, so it was quite difficult uh, uh, to properly communicate this to, the, uh, to our employees. So it was much more better for them acceptable to call that the culture of organization. So anyhow, uh, it was clear that we should have uh, this, uh, I would call the item in our system. We have management system and safety culture is one of the chapters in our uh, managerial system. And it is something what uh, have to be really carefully followed because if you say, okay, it is established, so it's, it's something what is good. No, so we are uh, conducting self-assessment of our culture. We do not have specialists in our organization, but we cooperate closely with the university, which deals with uh, these uh, uh, sciences and together. So uh, it is prepared the questionnaire, which is regularly uh, filled by our employees. It is done on voluntary basis. It is uh, done on paper, not to be afraid that so someone can identify whose answers we are reading. And uh, step by step, so we are collecting the ideas, what should be improved in the regulatory body to deliver in the proper manner the task which we have. Uh, anyhow, we are also uh, evaluating uh, in some manner safety culture of our license holder Again, so it is process which runs usually uh, two years. So our inspectors are collecting uh, evidence uh, during their inspection, so it is collected. Then there are also interviews again, so, and at the end, the evaluation of safety culture comes out. It is something what is, uh, what has to be properly communicated to our license holder uh, the safety culture is about attitudes of the leaders, but also of the common people. So if we want to change that, so we have to be clear and to show where we see some, uh, uh, I would say, deficiencies, what should be approved. And due to the fact that it is compulsory for our license holder to conduct their self-assessment of their safety culture, uh, what was curious, so we came to the same numbers, which were not very high, I have to say. So therefore, uh, we said that it's necessary to go further, that we should really start 
to communicate what uh, we evaluate as positive on our license holder, where they should improve, why sometimes we are really uh, very, very strictly uh, verifying uh, the requirements from legislation, uh, and in general what was also not very positive, so penalties in the last years so were much more often than it used to be in the past. And what is very important from my point of view, it is proper communication uh, inside the regulatory body as well as outside. Uh, we are a small regulatory body, so 130 people, so I know each one individually, so if they would like to communicate with me some aspects, so I'm always open to this communication. Uh, we always try to encourage them to think about how we can improve our job, uh, how we should really uh, have a proper communication with our license holder, really not, not just to be the regulator which says uh, it's bad, so, uh, but we try to say them, try to establish such a system which will work for us. It is not, the, uh, they are not the processes for us, they are for you. Uh, so it is something what is uh, important in our discussion, but what is for us also quite difficult is the proper communication with public. Uh, it means with the people living in the close vicinity of the plants, nevertheless also with the wider uh, environment as well as with NGOs. So as uh, it was said, I'm from Slovakia, it is quite small. Uh, the support for nuclear is quite high in Slovakia. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we have a neighbor who is not supporting nuclear, and namely their NGOs are quite intrusive and uh, not, not very, I would say, uh, uh, fair game playing. Nevertheless, so it is important to learn other people that despite the fact that the question they are asking already has been answered, uh, that the things they are uh, communicating to their newspapers are not in uh, equal to what we have said them, that we have to be professionals and to keep uh, calm and really just to repeat what we have said and to show that it is uh, it is going in the proper direction. Also, as far as concern, our uh, mission, so in general, in my view, the more endangered, uh, uh, if the operation of plant is not proper, are the people living in the vicinity of the power plant. So therefore, I, I try personally, and my people as well, to take as many contacts as possible uh, so we are taking part in their gatherings, uh, but also we encourage them if they have any doubts uh, to come to us and to, uh, let's say, ask what uh, they do not like. Even we invite them to, to visit regulatory body and to discuss about things, how they, it is uh, managed, so we can, what we can do for them. Uh, so communication has to be uh, really one of the, of the critical things which we have to cope with. I have to say that we have quite a lot of training for our people as far as concern safety culture, uh, where we uh, encourage them to fulfill questionnaires in self-evaluation. We have training as far as concern technical aspects and what is quite important, at the end of the year, people can write down what is their uh, view, what they need to get some more information and to assure for them some training. The other part of these requirements is filled by their supervisors, so we try to have as competent staff as it is possible, and I hope that we will be able to deliver our work so in proper manner in such uh, that the people as well as environment are going to protect it for safe life of them. So, thank you. Thank you, Marta. I particularly really like the, the openness and the willingness to share insights on how best to 
kind of mobilize a, a you know safety culture and leadership uh, approach. That, that 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 was great. Thank you, Mark Foy. Thanks very much, David. Um, I'm going to come at it from a slightly different perspective. So for me, for a long period, the industry that we have regulated was fairly quiescent. But during this time, our understanding of human aspects of nuclear safety has evolved significantly, particularly as DG Magwood has said in the period post Fukushima, and indeed as Marta has also just mentioned, post Chernobyl. We heard from my colleague Mark uh, and John Thielen about the two NEA reports that capture some of this learning by focusing on the human aspects of nuclear safety specifically around the impacts of regulators and industry on their respective safety cultures, and then secondly, the importance of leadership for safety in regulatory bodies, two very important areas. We actually need to use this understanding to good effect, not just licensees, but as regulators. We need to better consider human aspects and understand how our actions and behaviors impact on those that we regulate. This is important as the majority of national nuclear regulators are now facing a dynamic nuclear landscape with major new build ambitions globally. Reactor lifetime extensions are reality. We've also got major decommissioning programs underway with waste management challenges and options for final disposal being explored and developed. Quite a, a challenging environment. This changing landscape will involve existing licensees, but also many who will now be new to the nuclear industry and regulation. So it's important that we consciously consider what and how we do things as regulators to have the best impact. In the next few minutes, I hope to bring some of the content of the two NEO report, NEO, NEA reports we have heard about today to life. This through real examples from a regulatory context from my experience in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, around 13 years ago, ONR, or NII, our previous body, didn't secure the safety outcomes it required in a number of high hazard, high risk legacy facilities at the Sellafield site in Cumbria. As a regulator, we'd actually taken enforcement action in the early 2000s setting clear requirements of the end state that was to be achieved and by when at these facilities. As a consequence, we subsequently reviewed why progress hadn't been made in the 10-year period of the enforcement. The failure to achieve the right outcomes wasn't actually for the want of trying or lack of desire by any one organisation, be that the operator, government and also regulators. But what was clear is each stakeholder was viewing the challenges from their own perspective, not working together to solve the challenges, each highlighting things, each highlighting why things could not be done, with preconceived ideas of what the regulator requires and would or would not accept. During the review, we did recognize our own role as a regulator in this situation. We'd issued the enforcement, and for many years, for its duration, we'd kept a distance. Very much a parent and child relationship, regulator to regulated, and an <coughs> us and them relationship. Leaving the licensee to solve the significant remediation challenges itself. This established barriers to progress and led to very fixed mindsets on stakeholders' parts and those were not in the best interests of achieving progress and the required safety improvements. The magnitude of the remediation challenges there was such that they needed all stakeholders to work together constructively. Now the licensee does own and has to manage and control the risk, but it's reasonable to accept that we have to help them on that way forward. At that time, in 2013, as a direct consequence of the review, we responded by developing our own enabling approach to regulation, which is very much how we continue to work with the industry in the United Kingdom today. Subsequently publishing our own guidance of what it means for our inspectors in how they approach regulation, but also to provide clarity for industry on what it should expect from us as a regulator. 
It recognizes our own role in supporting the industry to achieve its desired outcomes safely. It involves, as has been mentioned earlier, a collaborative approach with licensees and wider stakeholders. All stakeholders working together to secure effective delivery against clear, prioritized outcomes, but also early engagement and establishing an aligned, common, purposeful, respectful approach of each other's respectful of each other's roles as well. But very much focusing on the outcomes that need to be achieved, not particularly the process to get there. This leads to fit for purpose solutions, aligned behaviors that build trust amongst all the stakeholders with the ability to identify and work together to remove blockages together. This, this response from us as a regulator was a fundamental change in our approach to being supportive with open and constructive dialogue, very much in the manner of what is set out in the documents developed by the NEA and the regulatory team. This led to a significant shift in culture of the licensees on site, moving to a much more can-do attitude, solution focused, with improved learning and confidence in delivery, which spread much wider than the immediate projects on the site and have endured since. It provided for credible accelerated programs for remediation and much improved mutually beneficial relationships that have endured since. This is a prime example of what is being articulated in the documents about regulators stopping to take stock reflecting on what was needed to change to enable progress and adapting our approach, which resulted in major changes in those that we regulate. The example emphasizes the importance of having the ability to understand and recognize the how, uh, how the interactions of regulatory bodies impact and influence the nuclear industry. Turning now to a second example that looks at nuclear safety leadership in regulatory bodies. As John Thielen has indicated, the new NEA report on leadership for safety highlights five steps for the development of effective leadership for safety. I'm gonna focus on the last step and my own personal experience on conducting an independent assessment of my own organization as safety culture. The Office for Nuclear Regulation in the United Kingdom commissioned an independent study by an expert independent organization linked to academia in the United Kingdom which considered our own organizational safety and security culture and how it impacted our effectiveness in delivering our regulatory mission. It was a comprehensive piece of work with inputs both from internal sources, our staff, and external bodies such as the industry we regulate, government, and other bodies. The results, what I would say, were quite interesting providing insights into why we as an organization and our people behave the way they do. Internally, it was clear that our predominant internal values and culture were found to be driven by a focus on our mission, which is ensuring the protection of society. But it also covered our reputation, professionalism, and technical competence, but also our need as a regulator for independence and being risk averse, but also a bias for process. We also focus very much on excellence as an organization and consensual leadership. I think what I would say there, those are many factors that you would want to have in a regulatory body and would expect to see in the type of people that we employ as a regulator and the regulatory role that we're asking them to fulfill. But these positive attributes to our culture can also have a negative side. The positives are around that commitment behind the mission, the level of expertise we have, ownership in terms of regulatory decisions and sponsorship behind that mission and the influence as a consequence because of the high levels of technical competence that we're able to have with the industry we regulate. But those facets can also hinder learning, hinder learning as an organization. They can also lead to overworking of staff, but change and decision making can also be slow and the focus on delivery and pro process can lead to us being inflexible. In terms of the study, there was also not much from our staff on the character of the organization, the character of us as a regulation, the people-centric aspects. We were seen as supportive because the review was done 
after COVID and during COVID, the view was that we've been very supportive of our staff, but not fully living our other desired values of fairness, open-mindedness and accountability, areas that are also important. In terms of external stakeholders, they see us as being trustworthy and a transparent regulator, professional and competent, so aligning with some of that internal views. It allowed us to establish good relationships and positively influence the duty holders and the industry. Our enabling approach to regulation was also highly regarded by the industry, and we were recognised as robust when more formal actions needed to be taken, so a good balance. Externally, though, quite interestingly, we were found to be living all of our desired values about being fair and open-minded and others. These results are extremely useful in informing how we communicate with our staff on notable change initiatives we want to implement. We've also established new approaches such as what we call leading O&R, supporting leaders in consistently role-modeling accountability, open-mindedness, fairness, and how to ensure that we empower our people well. We've also revised our leadership development programme and adjusted it as a consequence of what's been found through the study. I think what I would highlight is that it is a cultural, a cultural journey that we are on. It's about leaders and influencers walking the talk and leading by example. A theme highlighted by a number of the NRC commissioners this week in relation to cultural change, but also aspects highlighted in the documents produced by the NEA. What I would say is that we must all recognise that we each have a role in the culture and lived experience of those we engage and come into contact with, be it the light that we shine or the shadow that we cast. There are tools available that we can use to better inform our approaches, inform how we learn and how we grow. The two NEA reports highlighted today are two documents that provide insights and aspects of good practice. But the theory is, theory is just theory unless given life through use by the regulatory community and the industry. And I commend you to look at them and to look at how they can inform what you do as a community in the nuclear sector. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I Walk the walk. I thank you for that. I, I just, in my own personal journey uh, for safety culture and being a leader, that's the, the one thing I try to do and check myself on frequently and seek feedback. Am I really being the kind of leader that my staff expect? But moreover, how do I present myself in a broader form? So thank you for that very much. And Amik, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, so much. And uh, I really would like to... Uh, start with congratulating uh, on such a good report and uh, especially also uh, DJ Magwood for its, uh, his leadership in it. Talking about leadership, I think this is a very special way of leadership uh, which really has an impact uh, in, in, in for all of us, so thank you for that. I think this report uh, is really good because it's for and by practitioners. It's practical, it's usable, and it can guide us and regulators around the world. And actually, for us as the ANVS, it's quite timely, and I'll come back to that uh, later. I think one of the things I, I really think are important uh, in this report is the explaining of the mutual impact of the regulators and the licensees and how they, how they impact each other and how, as a regulator, you can really influence uh, safety culture of the, regulator, of the licensee, but also have to be open to receive uh, feedback and to be influenced by uh, the licensees as well. So this is, I think, in a very important uh, part of this uh, report. A mature safety culture is really crucial to uh, safety performance, and I'm going to make a uh, point here. I start with some general reflections, and then I go to our organization uh, specifically. Um, and uh, 
this special point is about diversity, as I already also said this morning. I would link the two uh, to them from the gender perspective to uh, safety culture and from safety culture back to gender uh, parity, but also diversity in a broader way. I would like to make the point here that diversity and inclusion is really crucial to safety culture. It's really part of it. It cannot be separated. And there I talk about diversity in a broad way. So age, technical background, cultural background, different, different competencies, and also gender. And gender and those other uh, issues like also the cultural backgrounds, you have to strive for balance there, not only because you need equal opportunities from a moral way, not only because you need everyone in a very scarce market, not only because it's a moral issue, but really as part of um, this broader diversity needed for better performance. It is well known that diverse teams perform better. It's important to avoid blind spots, to get the soft signals in the organization, to have trust, and also uh, to uh, really have open channels for communication. If you do inclusion in a proper way of diversity, it helps enormously. So I would like to uh, propose an extra enabler on your list. <laughs> you have a beautiful list of enablers for uh, safety culture. Maybe we should add diversity and inclusion uh, to this list. And there, of course, leadership also kicks in. Leadership on all levels. <coughs> it's leadership in our own organization and leadership in the role as a, le a regulator to the licensee. And I think you, it has been mentioned before already as well that um, leadership, leadership and safety culture is really for everyone in the organization on all levels. Because you need it also for the interface with the licensees, the license holders. And it's something that is really part of your organizational tissue, if it's good. However, I think we as senior management, as professional leaders, we have a special role. We really should walk the talk. We should set an example in our organization. And the setting the example is not only talking about it, but really doing things. And I think you already, uh, Mark, as well, uh, talk, spoke about that and gave some examples. Um, one of the things we did in uh, the AMVS, now I'm going to go to our organization, is um, go for an organizational change. I said already this morning as well, we, are, uh, we had a great opportunity that we need to get a lot of people on board, but also we needed to uh, do some changes in the organizations to accommodate it and also to open up some structures. And um, what we did is, and it has a strong relation to uh, safety culture, is put an emphasis on, as we call it, professional autonomy of the staff. So professional, professional autonomy, it's giving responsibility and space to the staff in the organization, but within clear regulatory framework, of course, to guide it and within clear uh, boundaries, you could say. And in order to do so and to make this grow, we developed a leadership program to support this development. Because then for leaders, for the management, it asks for different things. It asks for a different way of interacting with the staff and also to make very clear how the roles are and to open up uh, in a different way for them. 
And they got, this was a chance also to develop the competencies uh, of the management and become more effective leaders. Open communication is one of the key issues there. And also the message that mistakes can be made, which is usually a very difficult one within uh, the environment of nuclear safety. But mistakes in the organization, they will be made. So it's very important to be open to it and also set an example there. So what I try to do as well, and that's also the walk the talk, I sometimes make mistakes. So I try to be as open as possible about it. And just when we meet with people say, well, you know, this was not a very bright thing that I did, so apologies. And what can we learn from it? So to really have this kind of conversation, and I use also the blogs uh, to do so, sometimes to reflect on these issues. And we really try to put that into uh, the mindset of all the management layers within the organization. Uh, so people feel free to give the signals. People fee feel free to also say when they make mistakes. Um, we also have some challenges. Uh, in the organization. One is what I mentioned also as an opportunity, that's the growth of the organization. We're growing very fast. So uh, that's also a difficulty for the organizational culture, for the um, safety culture within the organization. With a lot of new staff, we do need to train them very well and to make sure that they know what they need to know and they know what they need to do. But we also need to be welcoming, making sure that they, even as newcomers, also will be heard and that people that are sitting there already longer in their jobs won't say just like, okay, uh, I've been here longer than you, you should first learn or things like that, which is, happens often in an organization. So another uh, thing that needs to be done and uh, we need to organize different ways of meeting each other because we are growing in from a small organization into a medium-sized organization where not everyone will know each other easily. And we need to do more in writing. So uh, we do have to write down more. And that's really important also if you get a lot of new people to preserve and to Im improve our safety culture. The second challenge we have is um, that we do a lot of things regarding to safety culture, but somehow not in a very comprehensive way. We never had a real program or a prom pro programmatic way of doing it. And to be honest, we never have made an assessment yet. So these are things on our list to be done. And we even, the RSS, when they came to, uh, to uh, do a review, they said to us, you'd better you know, organize this a little bit more, make it more comprehensive. So we took that advice. And so there it is, this document that is really very timely for us as an organization as well, that will really, it has so much practical uh, um, yeah, tools. So uh, thank you again. I think it will help uh, the ANVS and uh, we will gladly work uh, from that document and learn from our colleagues around the table and uh, elsewhere in the world. So thank you. Thank you very much, Annemiek. I'd like to... I touched on this before, but I just wanted to highlight that your, your thoughts uh, earlier today on, uh, on gender equality and how you married those with your thoughts today, I think that's important because it highlights, and we'll have, we have a couple questions related to that here that we're getting. It highlights the need for open communications, but also embracing, listening, hearing people, helping them feeling, knowing that they are included, even if the decision doesn't necessarily go their way or an outcome isn't what they expected. They understand and their thoughts were appreciated. So I really 
I really thought that that struck a chord with me and I think I'm sure with others. So thank you. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Bond, uh, if you'd like to share some thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I comment on two of the questions you raised. The first one is how can regulatory bodies develop and sustain an accountability-oriented enabling approach to regulation? And another is how can regulatory bodies build and maintain the trust of the public uh, in their regulatory approach? Um, to be honest, I am not a specialist in safety culture. Then you will wonder why I am chairing this working group. When talking about safety culture, people tend to highlight success stories, not negative stories. I have that kind of impression. Experiencing Fukushima Daiichi accident, we Japanese are not afraid of talking about negative aspects. So I undertook the role of chair as I thought I would be able to lead honest discussions. So I would like to share my thoughts about implication of these two reports in light of Japan's current situation. First point is relationship between the regulatory body and licensees in Japan. As the report points out, respect, openness, and trust underpin the positive interaction between the regulator and the operator. Based on the lessons from Fukushima Daiichi accident, the NRA, Nuclear Regulation Authority, updated regulatory requirements and was given authority for backfitting and this impacted the relationship between the regulatory body and licensees. Licensees thought the NRA is unpredictable and tried to move carefully. But we NRA sometimes frustrated by the licensees' indecisive attitudes. The situation is getting better, but still on the way to building respect and trust. So our relationship is not mature enough to shift to the accountability-oriented enabling regulation. So we need to take a responsive approach in the long term. That is my impression. But more serious problem is the relation to the public. Since the accident, Japanese society has had a sense that the regulator should always take a severe attitude to nuclear operators. It is challenging to convince the public that the AER accountability-oriented enabling regulation is the best approach. This is not just a matter of how to explain it. The concept of AER is based on the idea that the regulator and the operator share the same goal, but have different roles and work independently. In Japan, people think the safety regulation is a confrontation between the regulator and operator. It is just like a sheriff and villain. The fundamental principle for nuclear safety has not prevailed. It is a big challenge because society as a whole has to undergo a paradigm shift. You understand the difficult situation in Japan, but I think 
it may not be a problem specific to Japan. There could be similar situations if the public do not have confidence in the performance of nuclear sector. The report focused on the relationship between the regulator and the operator. But in this context, we need to broaden our perspective to the dynamics in the interconnected system that includes other stakeholders as well. So that is my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Very much appreciated. And again, the hard work of you and the working group just so is recognized and, and really is going to pay dividends. Director Je General Magwood, for your comments. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> I'll try to be brief because I think we're running very short on the time here. But um, a, a, f a few observations. And I, I want to start with leadership. And I appreciate um, the panel's conversation about leadership. And I think most of them reflect that, that leading by example is, is elemental um, to um, the job of a leader. I think one complexity that I've observed over the years is that there's still, a, I guess I would call it, a confusion by many people about the difference between managing and leading. I, I think that's always been um, part of the problem because it is relatively easy to assess management. Um, you simply have to make sure that things were accomplished. Um, things got done on time. Therefore, we have a good manager. Well, you may have a good manager, but you may not have a good leader. And, and if you don't have a way of assessing and understanding leadership, you may not even know that you don't have a good leader. So leading by example is important, but it's also important um, to have some way of assessing leadership. That, that's one of the things I think about um, the report on leadership that's so important because it quantifies um, leadership in nuclear safety organizations in a way that I've not seen before and I, I think is very, very instructive. Um, the characteristics we saw on the wheel that was shown on the chart a while back I think are all extremely important and it provides a bit of a roadmap for um, those in regulatory organizations that want to develop leaders um, to, um, to have a way of assessing the kinds of behaviors and projecting the kinds of behaviors that we would like to see. And, um, and maybe in some sense, and I'm sure that um, Marta and Mark and Anamik and, um, and Nobuhiko will, will think about this, should we be incorporating some of these principles in our uh, human resource policies so that we are actually evaluating people on some of these um, characteristics, um, which was different from what normally happens in organizations. But, but I, I'm, I'm, I've seen in too many instances around the world where people who simply accomplish their mission are, are given plaudits and given elevation, um, but um, may have done so in a way that has um, disenfranchised their staff or ignored um, comments from staff and, and outsiders and, and really um, done not as good a job as what could have been if the leadership were there. So I think that the helping people assess this is very important because I think, as, as I think several of the panelists said, it's also very important that everyone in the system provide some level of leadership in, at their level. And, um, leadership for safety is something that's everybody's responsibility. And the more that people understand what the characteristics are, the more they can look into themselves to see, uh, what am I lacking? What do I need to improve? How do I, um, how do I incur, how do I take steps in myself to become a better leader? So that's, uh, that's very important. Um, and uh, moving on to the other issue of, of safety culture. And, uh, I mean, I think this concept that you've, you've named, uh, Accountability Oriented Enabling Regulation, AER, that's a new acronym we've all learned today, uh, AER, um, is, is, is an excellent phrase. I think it captures this concept very well. 
And um, I've shared with some, I think I shared with the working group, um, and I won't go into the specifics of this, but I shared with the working group an experience I had when I was at the NRC when I had a licensee um, who, a uh, senior manager who met with me and told me that he thought his staff had presented to um, him a very important technology that he thought made a significant improvement in safety. Um, and I said, that was good. But he said, but we're not going to use it. And I said, explain that to me. Why would you not use this technology? And he said, because the staff has given us absolutely no credit for the use of this technology. And um, getting credit for this technology is, will be such an arduous and expensive journey, it simply isn't worth it to us. So we're not going to do it. Now, I've often thought about this example, and of course, there's specifics to this that um, it's, it's not a simple story, but it does reflect the impact that regulators have on, on licensees. And, you know, one could argue that this licensee, if they really believed that safety was enhanced with this technology, that perhaps they should implement it with or without, you know, credit from the, from the, reg, from the regulator if it's that, that important. But they have been trained to not do things like that unless they get um, approval from, from the regulator. I, and again, while there's specifics to these sorts of examples, I think it is instructive to think about, and I think that regulators have to think about um, how they, what messages they send through their processes, their decision making, um, and I know that staff with the NRC who are here know of multiple examples where, rate, where licensees will tell you today that if they'd known how hard it was going to be to do Project X, they would never have started it in the first place because it took so long and it cost so much and it was so painful that we don't want to do that, even though it, the outcome would be better, an improvement for safety. So these are things I think regulators need to think about. In some cases, the regulatory, the regulator's behavior might be entirely appropriate. But in other cases, one suspects that um, different approaches might be taken. So I do think it's very important for the leaders and regulatory organizations to think about this sort of effect and the kind of message they're sending through the licensees because we want licensees to be responsible for safety. We want to, regulators to have accountability-oriented enabling regulation. Um, but that doesn't happen um, just because we say it should happen. It happens on a day-to-day -day basis at many levels within regulatory organizations, and that's something that is very important to observe. So, um, Dave, please. Yeah, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate those, those thoughts. We, at this point in the program, um, we've gotten, let me tell you, a rich set of questions from you all. Um, we've got about four, five minutes. <laughs> And there's, there's a question that I, I, I know we've addressed a little bit on the panel, and, um, and the panel's looking at me as if, okay, who is he going to ask? <laughs> but uh, what it gets to, and I'm going to paraphrase a bit, is we heard today from you all that openness uh, and transparency is important. We also talked about the fact that it's not unusual for a regulator to have a difficult conversation with a licensee regarding their performance, be it safety culture or otherwise. I just wondered if you could share some thoughts on um, how you engage the licensee in a dialogue in a, in a way that uh, perhaps the public can understand the circumstance, the regulatory perspective, and, and get, a, and get a, an effective and, and fulsome response from the licensee. Perhaps not all licensees want to be as open and transparent in a public forum. Um, any thoughts on best practices or experiences where you've had a, a truly engaging dialogue with a licensee, talking about a difficult challenge uh, a, as a means, at least one means, of instilling public trust. So uh, for me, uh, the example that I talked about around Sellafield and um, the need to be open and transparent about what the situation was, and even as a regulator way back um, two decades ago, 
we hadn't been open in our own communication about what the situation was, um, the level of waste, um, the level of hazard and risk. And what it does is, if we are a regulator and willing to be open about what the situation is, the licensee themselves follow. Uh, but there's a process there of engagement that has to be had between ourselves as a regulator and the licensee to get an agreed way forward. You can't drag them kicking and screaming. That's a really difficult situation to be in and to manage. I think if you're a proactive um, regulator willing to listen to the concerns of those that were regulating and actually hear what they're saying and try and steer a clear path through those issues, um, I think you can actually get an agreed uh, an acceptable way forward where you can both try and communicate the issues out to the public in what I would call um, uh, easily understood terms, avoiding the technical jargon. Uh, I think that's essential if you want to get the public on side and them to get to understand the issues that are at hand and you're trying to deal with. Because if you're talking in technical babble or regulatory jargon, they will never get to understand it and you have to work collectively together to communicate the message to the public and other mm -hmm. stakeholder bodies as well. That's great. Anamik, you have an additional thought? Yeah, well, maybe um, we are um, working on um, publishing the inspection results mm. and uh, we are not there uh, completely, but what we did in the process is um, having interaction with uh, the licensees on it uh, and, and see where their fears were. And, and, and so we were in a, in a strong interactive process with them also on how to do that. And then um, as a next step, we uh, involved also a focus group of the public to see if we would publish it in such a way, if that would make sense to them. And then we got back very strong feedback uh, um, that they didn't want that much detail, that they just want to know from us that it's okay or it's not okay and some more. And then of course you can go uh, deeper, drill, drill deeper into it. But um, so I thought, this, this was really last year a very enriching experience to have both these conversations with uh, the licensees and with uh, the focus group and the public and, I, and, and, and that helps us in uh, finding a way of, of giving that openness as well. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll just offer, uh, without getting into specifics, I know the NRC has leveraged focus groups and public engagement with the licensees to seek a common understanding yeah. to find regulatory solutions to challenging technical problems and yeah. it, that really pays dividends when we, when we can when we can go about it in that way um, we are right at our time uh, oh. director general any final thoughts um, just a very quick first thank you david for um, chairing this panel and my thanks to this excellent panel very important comments were made so i hope everyone had an opportunity to think about these um, these thoughts um, but i also wanted to take the opportunity to to certainly thank the working groups um, that, that put this together mark and his um, his team and john you and your team um, did an outstanding job it was three years of work um, so this is a pretty significant um, accomplishment uh, that that has been created here and i think it is one that, that really will stand the test of time. So thank you both for, for the effort. And uh, of course, I, I do need to um, give a lot of recognition to the working group chair, um, Commissioner Bond, for um, encouraging and um, guiding this over the course of these three years. And, um, and to Florence Marr, of course, for her hard work. and. Um, harassing me over the last couple of weeks to make sure we got this out the door in time. So, uh, Florence, thank you for that. But uh, again, hope you all um, have the opportunity to download the report and read it and um, take some lessons home to your own organizations. Thank you so much, Director General. And I am just, again, I was very honored to be the chair of this, of this session and to work with such an august group. The work is amazing. Uh, I'm sure it will have lasting impact. A um, couple quick thoughts. 
uh, that I had was, uh, Director General, that you said you had to kind of push the I believe button on, on safety culture. And I think that that is true in a lot of arenas. So how do you find that? How do we align that safety culture and safety and security are, there's a close nexus. They are one and the same. How do we do it? So that is, and I think we heard today from the panelists some practical solutions on how you might go about account, accomplishing that, including some uh, practical elements of both of your reports. So thank you very much. Uh, the, for the folks in the audience, there are, um, I apologize if we didn't get to your questions. They were very good, by the way. Um, and um, that we did include opportunities to get in contact with Catherine uh, Thompson, if you have any additional questions, and we provided her email. Uh, we provided QR links uh, for the reports and contact for uh, working group members in case you have any additional questions. And with that, I uh, conclude the session. Thank you all again.